Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We're physicians and professors at Yale University trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. We're excited to welcome Dr. Malika Mendu today. But first, we, we always check in on current hot topics in health and health care. And Harlan, you pointed out to me that the Lasker Awards were awarded uh, maybe 10 or 11 days ago. I hadn't noticed it. And it's a fascinating topic. Can you tell our audience a little about like, what are they and and why this is exciting? So Lasker Awards are, you know, there's a lot of anticipation for them every year. They're very prestigious awards that have been given out since, I don't know, 1945 and were you know, put out by the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. And, and the reason that they're important is because they're thought to be a prelude to the Nobel Prizes, that it, sometimes people call them the American Nobels, because a lot of the people who got Laskers end up going on to get to get Nobels. And they, they've, they fall into three categories. You got a basic medical award, a clinical medical award, and then, then Bloomberg actually put in some money so that there would be a public service award. And these are just, you know, highly, highly respected and maybe some of the top international accolades that there are outside of the Nobel Prizes. And, and so th- who won the award this year? Yeah, well, I wanted to talk about this, the basic medical research award. And it was given to two people who really was for their invention of AlphaFold, which is an artificial intelligence systems which predicts the three-dimensional structure of proteins from a one-dimensional sequence of their amino acids. Okay, so that's like a whole bunch of stuff. But let me just break that down just a yeah. little bit. And just to say that, you know, we have DNA. DNA is, is our genetic code. Some parts of that DNA are transcribed into a, a, a messenger RNA that then produces a protein. The protein have amino acids. But, you know, when we were growing up, you know, we would take biochemistry and learn about some of these proteins. And basically we would learn the one dimensional structure would say, here's the sequence of amino acids for a given protein. But in real life, these proteins actually fold in all sorts of different directions. And, and the way that they fold, it turns out, is very important for understanding how you might attack disease. I mean, misfolding can cause problems. Mutations can end up causing uh, issues. And you can actually potentiate uh, the effect of a particular protein by accentuating the kind of fold so that it hits the receptor in a different way. And so you know, here's a way that I've thought about. So imagine a protein is like a a necklace with a series of beads. But imagine these beads each have like a little bit of a magnetic force, you know, north and south. So some of the beads are repelling each other, some are attracting each other. And if you just threw this, this beads up into the air, the thing actually falls into a configuration based on the ways in which these magnets act. Well, it turns out in real life, these amino acids can form bonds. They're, they actually are attracting or repelling certain other amino acids. And in addition, other things, hydrogens and so forth, can join those proteins to accentuate their charge or polarity. So that it, it turns out to be kind of hard to predict, well, what happens when they begin to fold? And so this is a problem that's perplexed uh, people for, for decades. And with the advances in compute and with the kind of advances in in AI, you know, this group that that came out of a company called DeepMind that was eventually bought by Google, was able to to figure out how to do this really well. And so they could do this for, you know, the truth is the way we've been doing this is to use x-ray crystallography. Exactly. So so we've been able to figure out the way they look after the fact, but we've never been able to predict just based on the sequences, right? Well, we have to go through the labor intensive, hard work, and th- yeah. that ended up maybe characterizing, I, I, I don't know, you know, only about 200,000 structures sounds like a lot, but they're probably 8 million protein sequences. So if you really want to get to the end game of, of characterizing all these protein sequences, it was thought you need to go a different route. But it's more than that, right? Because as you said, it's not just about what it is, it's about what it could be. And what might change if, if you were able to change a gene or change a protein sequence? So there's a lot to the possibilities here. So knowing the configuration, knowing what it looks like in three-dimensional space helps you under, understand how might I block that protein? Or again, how might I put it in position? Or if it's misfolded, if there's been a mutation, how do I fix the protein? And you know, we think this is going to be a boon to drug development and advancing our understanding of biology, and it's already made a big impact. There's another thing here, Howie, that I think is interesting, which is 
You, you know, these people who did this, Hassabis and uh, a Jumper, are the two people who got the award, they're like the Mozarts of our time. You know, uh, Hassabis was, you know, homeschooled by his parents. He was winning chess at, you know, at a very early age, actually making a lot of money. He, he could have gone to college at age 15 or 16, took a gap year and started making computer games. I mean, everything he touched was, was you know, turned to, to something interesting and, and useful. He even uh, and, and then he comes into DeepMind as a co-founder. And Jumper, you know, is a guy who gets his Ph.D. looking at protein folding. But, you know, he gets his Ph.D. in 2017. I mean, this is where we are, How It used to be like Lasker Awards would be like 30 yeah, years. Yeah, somebody invented something 50 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But, but because these are so profound and, and, you know, this is a great equalizer, the AI. I mean, young folks, you know, who are dedicated to trying to help make advances end up making, you know, just remarkable contributions. There's one other piece to this that I thought was worth mentioning, Howie, which is you could say, so when they predict a structure, how can you tell that they're right? And, you know, what, what's the way that this works? And it turns out there's this organization that has characterized the, the folding of proteins, but keeps it secret and sees whether or not, you know, serves as a, a means to evaluate groups that say we figured out how to predict folding of proteins. And, and that's an amazing thing. It's called the Critical Assessment of, of Structure Prediction. Uh, and they meet a, have a meeting every two years and track progress in structure prediction. But I've been thinking, Howie, how much we need that in AI writ large. You know, when somebody comes up and says, I've got a predictive model for sepsis, we need an independent group that actually has ground truth, knows what the answers are, but doesn't disclose them and lets people tell you what they think the answers are and produces sort of independent reports. I, I thought that was a very, very cool thing that, that there actually is a way to evaluate them. Pretty sure we're going to keep coming back to this. And it's a great, great introduction to this topic. Yeah. So let's get to our guest. We have a great guest today. Yes. Dr. Malika Mendu is the Vice President of Clinical Operations and Care Continuum at Brigham and Women's Hospital. In this and previous roles at the Brigham, she has led numerous impactful quality improvement initiatives, including lean rounding efforts, addressing length of stay concerns. A practicing nephrologist, Dr. Mendu serves as an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and in addition to being recognized as an innovative and strategic thinker within a large healthcare organization, she has authored over 80 peer-reviewed articles about quality, continuity, and innovations in care. She holds a bachelor's degree from Brown, as well as an MD and MBA from the Yale School of Medicine and the Yale School of Management, respectively, which is when I was fortunate to first meet her. She completed her residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, followed by a nephrology fellowship jointly with Brigham and Women's and Mass General Hospital. So first of all, thanks very much for joining us here on the podcast. And I want to start off and draw a distinction between the work you do and some of our previous speakers in that you are deep in the weeds of operations. Like you are helping hospitals manage through one of the most challenging times when financial burdens make it almost an existential threat, and yet you are there trying to help them face up to that. And there's a whole host of innovations, and I want you to be able to talk about them, but they, they are about getting people out of their room earlier, getting people to a safe space, making sure they have a safe exit from the hospital reducing readmissions, things like that. Can you give us a little sense of, number one, what got you motivated to do that and what you consider the most important work you've done at this point? Yeah, well, first off, thank you, Howie and Harlan, for having me on your podcast. I've long been an admirer of both of you, so it's a real privilege. Uh, you're right, Howie. I have a really unique role here at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'm very fortunate to have the role. I get to see patients on a regular basis, pursue clinical research that I'm passionate about, and uh, advise mentees and trainees, uh, and pursue this phenomenal operations work in collaboration with other administrators. So in my role, currently, I have three main areas of focus. So inpatient operations, care continuum management, and value-based care. And what we're seeing is significant capacity constraints that we just didn't see pre the COVID pandemic. The reason for that is multifold. So first, since the pandemic, we have seen a real exodus of staff in some critical areas. And I would highlight the post-acute area is really a critical area. And you can look at the US 
um, labor statistics and see just the drop in staffing, uh, skilled nurses and other staff. So what that has resulted in then is closure and constraining of post-acute availability. And for the hospital, that means we, when we need to discharge patients to a rehabilitation hospital or other post-acute services, we just don't have the capacity. And so then patients are staying in our beds longer. And that's challenging because that reduces our inpatient capacity. That's not ideal for patients who need to progress and they don't get the rehab that they need in a timely way. That constrains us further in terms of our emergency departments where not infrequently, I would say once or twice a week, we have almost double the volume of our actual ED beds of patients in the hallways. And then that leads to further increased demand for services. And we've learned from the COVID pandemic that deferred care really can be exponential. If you're looking at certain populations like patients who have vascular conditions and need timely care, that builds up. And then that puts further constraints on our staff. And so it really is a circular challenge that we're facing what I will say, though, because I'm an optimist and I love operations and, and the type of innovation we can implement as a result of uh, healthcare operations, is that it's forcing us to think in different ways, to be more efficient with existing resources because we are limited by staff, so we have to be. And it's also offering an opportunity to create win-wins in areas where previously it was not as clear. So as an example of this, Value-based care and fee-for-service traditionally has been, definitely pre-pandemic, kind of seemed at odds with one another. On one hand, you have the value-based care organizations, primary care primarily, that's trying to keep patients out of the hospital, out of the ED. And then the concern has been, well, is that going to encroach on our fee-for-service business? Now, they're in synergy because if we are successful with our value-based care business, and we're able to keep patients out of the emergency department, it's going to help us with our ED boarding situation. And similarly, in the inpatient side, if we're able to keep, keep patients who can be managed at home, and we have a phenomenal home hospital program that we've developed here, we can keep them at home in, in the hospital, then that's going to give us more capacity. And so that has really offered this ability to think about these win-wins. Some of the areas where we've thought about efficiencies Care continuum management is an area that I help oversee. We've developed a framework here where we've recognized that because of the capacity constraints and patients getting stuck in beds, we need to understand exactly what's happening, which populations are actually getting stuck, and who might actually be able to go home if we're able to come up with home services. So we've created what we call an interdisciplinary care optimization dashboard. Our case managers are collecting data on a regular basis around who's medically ready, and if they're medically ready and not discharged, what are the barriers? And we're cataloging those barriers and using that as a system to be able to say, here are some key populations, patients who are on dialysis, patients who have tracheostomies, substance abuse disorders, then how do we work creatively with our post-acute partners to ensure that those patients have that throughput? Similarly, our case managers are uh, implementing an early screening for discharge planning tool where they're actually identifying patients who may not need their services, so they can then focus on those who are the most complex and do need their services. And then other creative strategies like expanding our hospice partnerships here in the hospital, because if we don't have the post-acute capacity and we have someone who's at the end of life, they may be more appropriate for hospice uh, than a post-acute facility. And frankly, we've had very low rates of hospice in the past, um, which has not served our patients well. So. Those are some of the areas that we are particularly focused on right now. And you can probably get a sense that even though it's challenging, I'm very enthusiastic about what we've done and where we're headed because pressure does make diamonds. You know, it seems to me like things blew up everywhere. And what I mean by that is when I'm hearing you talk, it's kind of like the same thing we've experienced here. Long lines of people in the hallway in the ED. You want to get a, a you're talking about length of stay in the way in which the hospital stacked up. But, you know, try to get an elective MRI, try to get an elective CT scan, try to get, you know, try to see a cardiologist electively. You know, in our place, you're talking months. 
how are you thinking? You know, that you're in operations. You're, you've got this challenge. You're trying to make things work every day. You got a crisis, an hour probably you've got to solve. But then the long thing is, how do we get to a better day where, where we, you know, are breaking down these barriers? To me, yes, we are facing incredible challenges. This is the time for real innovation. So, uh, we recently published a paper in the Journal of General Internal Medicine that came out this month, led by Dr. Isaac Chua, one of our phenomenal uh, general internal medicine and palliative care junior faculty, where we implemented a positive feedback process, a standardized process as part of our mortality review. Uh, and the reason we did this is that just as we fortunately now have across academic medical centers, a standardized transparent process around safety reporting and mortality review, we need to have a parallel process for positive feedback. I helped oversee our mortality review process for a number of years here at Brigham, and I reflected on when I would review these reviews, obviously the opportunities to do better, provide better care, but when I would see a review come over that would happen to have positive gratitude, appreciation for an individual, a team, how much we learn from that. And so we put this into place, which is to add a question to the standardized mortality review tool. We then looked at data over the course of a year. We had implemented this at Brigham and other uh, hospitals across our system. And we found some really interesting information from this analysis. First, when we look at key themes, and, and that really is what mattered to us initially in looking at this analysis. So some of the key themes first was the ability to provide exemplary patient and family-centered care was number one highlighted by our, our staff. Number two was uh, demonstrating mastery of clinical medicine. And third was being an empathic team member and, and offering peer support. We also looked at dynamics between providers, role types, departments. Uh, we found, for example, that nurses were more likely to recognize those uh, across role types. And then uh, another example is surgeons are more likely to praise outside of their department versus in, inside their department, which might counter stereotypes about surgeons. And so I'm really excited about this work. Um, we are looking to expand it here at Brigham and think about how we tie this data to outcomes such as reporting on safety culture and teamwork and, and wellness for a couple of reasons. One is the organizations need to know what matters to their frontline staff. And they need to be sensitive to that and they need to amplify those messages. Two, we can really learn from best practices, just like we learn from what doesn't go right, we need to learn from what does go right and then think about how to incorporate that into training and onboarding. And then third is just what we talked about around staffing, which is we need to put some innovative solutions in place to really improve the culture, show our appreciation. And if we don't, if we don't do things in a different way now, we are gonna be in even more trouble down the road. So that's one example of, of some innovative work we've led. I want to reflect on the fact that you are a practicing nephrologist. You still publish in the nephrology literature. And I'm curious what lessons you've learned. This is, you know, end-stage renal failure, which is a big part of nephrology practice, or at least avoiding it as part of it. Um, I'm curious to, to hear from you about how that microcosm, that small area of medicine has big lessons because there are a lot of areas where there's overlap. Can you speak to yeah. that and what you've learned? Thanks for highlighting that. And I think uh, sometimes it's not quite apparent that there are these, that nephrology and, and specifically our chronic kidney disease patients who have advanced chronic kidney disease who uh, um, some of them end up on dialysis or need a transplant, that in some ways that's a microcosm of all of the challenges that we we're facing in healthcare. And it's interesting when I was pursuing a, a fellowship and, and indicated I was gonna pursue a fellowship in nephrology, I got advice from a lot of very well-meaning people to say, if you wanna do healthcare leadership, maybe don't think about nephrology because you don't see a lot of nephrologists out there. But then as I started my fellowship, I realized, wow, this is the field that absolutely needs care delivery innovation and operational excellence. I think what you're highlighting, Howie, is that when you look at our clinical outcomes for patients who end up on dialysis, 
we have far to go compared to other areas of medicine where there have been much where there's been much more innovation. And similarly, if you look at the disparities in care, they're incredibly pronounced. One out of 11 black men will end up on dialysis in their lifetime. Patients who are black are almost four times more likely to end up on dialysis than patients who are white. It really lays bare just how many challenges we have in our healthcare system. I will say some of the positive work that's happened over the last couple of years, one is the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, which was signed by President Trump, did put a focus on kidney disease in a way that frankly hadn't happened since the 1970s and the, and, uh, the ESRD benefit as part of Medicare. Um, where there's this focus on dialysis and specifically trying to improve the adoption of home dialysis and transplantation, knowing that it is better for patients to utilize those modalities as opposed to the default in this country, which is in-center hemodialysis. In addition, there are these uh, newer kidney care models that have emerged through CMMI, uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation, which uh, focus on how we can improve care, both upstream for advanced CKD patients, and then those patients who are already on dialysis. And one of the innovations that I'm particularly excited about is the health equity incentive as part of this end-stage renal disease treatment choices model, which essentially recognizes that in order to bridge the gaps in outcomes for patients, you need to have investment. So you need to incentivize and say, we recognize that you dialysis clinic, you nephrology practice, you will need to invest resources in order to have comparable outcomes because there are real issues around social determinants of health and access. Um, so I'm excited about that. That was the first um, uh, health equity incentive that really came across through CMMI. And I'm hopeful that that has the opportunity we'll have to see based on the data of, of uh, having some impact in terms of disparities. We cannot thank you enough for what you've done for patients, for Yale, um, and you have a long and great career ahead of you, I know. So thanks for joining us on the podcast today. It's great to have you on. Thank you both. It's been a real honor. Thank you. Well, well that's a terrific interview, Howie. And as you said, you know, here's someone who's really invested in operations quality and and is an you know outstanding clinician and is a researcher. I mean, you know. And teacher. It's really amazing. But, but let's get to your segment uh, this week, Howie. And I know that you've got a lot of things uh, on your mind around social determinants this week. Yeah. So this is a topic that, you know, you have done a lot of scholarly work on. But I want to sort of go up about 30,000 feet and highlight uh, an update to a program that was begun by our former guest and the current CDC director, Mandy Cohen, when she was Secretary of Health for the state of North Carolina. So the Healthy Opportunities Pilot, or HOP for short, aims to comprehensively test and evaluate how addressing the social determinants of health, access to healthy food, transportation, safe and clean housing, interpersonal safety, and so on, can improve health outcomes, all the while reducing healthcare utilization rates and emergency services for Medicaid members while improving other outcomes. So this is lofty in terms of its goals, but it's definitely what we would like to see. So there was a recent article I saw that had some nice anecdotes about how this program is beginning to help some of the poorest, some of the most under-resourced North Carolinians get healthy food and more secure housing. But this is no small pantry. I mean, this is a $650 million undertaking that is approved by the federal government as a pilot using Medicaid funds. And they're hoping to see these improvements in outcomes and and reduction in resources. But right now, the jury is definitely still out. But we're going to be building the data off of this longstanding uh, pilot. So I wanted to bring it up because you talk about so- social determinants of health. You've investigated it. What What are you thinking when you hear about this? So these are dominant influences on health. And for a long time, people were trying to you know think that this isn't within our purview. But if we're interested in the health of our patients and what happens to them, it must be. People would tell us to ignore social determinants because we should treat everyone the same regardless of their they're standing in social context, but that can't be true because their needs are different and we need to address them. But let me just get something straight here, Howie. That's the first time I ever heard a pilot project for $650 million. That sounds like an awful lot of money, is it? 
So, so on the first hand, it sounds huge and it is huge in my mind. $650 million is no small change for a state like North Carolina. But the Medicaid budget for North Carolina is $20 billion a year. So the $650 million is over five years. Here we're talking about they're going to be spending probably more like $110 to $130 billion on Medicaid. This is chump change. This is point. 5% perhaps mm. of the Medicaid budget, but it at least gives us some answers or, or hopefully will. Would we be better off just writing people checks and trying to address poverty rather than try to build out these mitigation systems? There are other people that are investigating things like that, by the way. I mean, not necessarily through the Medicaid program, but there are pilot projects going on like that. What we have learned is that just cutting people you know, uh, electronic benefit transfer funds and allowing them to spend their own money does not have the same impact as giving them the comprehensive exposure to why eating healthier is better, finding the right people who will benefit those that actually already have sicknesses and comorbidities, all those things intertwine. And so we believe at least that this is a more thoughtful approach. What are the features of this? I mean, how is it different than just handing out food in communities or, you know, it yeah, what's I, unique I, about it than food kitchens? Yeah, so it's a lot. It's comprehensive. It's education for individuals. It's finding the right people. So if you're on Medicaid, you're already impoverished. But then it goes steps further and says, are you already facing other social determinant of health uh, obstacles? Do you already have a comorbidity like diabetes or obesity? Do your children have obesity? And then it's not just the food, although the food is a central component, but it's also safe and affordable housing. It's making sure that families can have housing security as well as food security. It's making sure that people don't face violence in the home. So it's a really comprehensive program addressing some of the biggest obstacles that some of the poorest people face, unfortunately. And you have to be on Medicaid. So there are a lot of poor people who aren't on Medicaid. So they they don't get in, right? They don't get into the pilot project. But again, if we learn the right lessons, one would hope that if we find that this works, there will be other types of pilots that address how do we get to the many millions of people who are uninsured, ineligible for Medicaid, but nonetheless poor, also face these challenges. So let me ask you just finally. So it's obviously the right thing to do. But if this doesn't show an ROI, a return on investment, doesn't actually decrease healthcare utilization, do you think that there's some concern that it just won't be supported, even though it will have improved health outcomes and, and, and again, been the right thing to do? Do we have to really show savings? I, I'm like you, Harlan, though. I think we've got to we've got to accept the data when we get it and figure it out. My guess is that it's going to have pluses and minuses. Maybe it won't reduce overall healthcare spending, but if it reduces uh, patients' uh, risk factors for long-term uh, survival, you know, to allow them a longer-term survival, if it gives people better quality of life. They're measuring this on many, many different spheres. There are academics like you down in North Carolina, maybe not quite like you, I should say. But, no, better, but, better. No, better. no, but people that really are taking this very yeah. seriously from a scholarly point of view, and we need that. We can't throw money and just say, let's see if it works. we got to test it, and they are testing it. We just have to fix this. But, but I really love this. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how do we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. Or X or whatever it is. Yeah, I know. I, I can't give it up yet, but I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K Yale. And I'm at the Howie. That's at the Howie. You can also email us at health.veritas at yale.edu. And by the way, Harlan, I think one of our guests did contact us this week with a question. Oh, yeah. So somebody was a little confused with our discussion about Sudafed last week and the two medications. And you're the expert on this. So I, <laughs> I must have followed the explanation. So Sudafed was called that because it had ephedrine, which is effective. And, yes. But but has a lot of other issues, including being used to make meth and yes. put behind the screens. Yes. So the company's made another, right, another version Correct. of it. Correct. You want so, to go ahead? Finish. Yeah. So you go back 30 years or 40 years, we thought there were three drugs that worked, phenylpropanolamine, pseudofedrin, and phenylephrine. Now we've learned last week, phenylephrine doesn't work. We took phenylpropanolamine off the market for adverse events, and we're left with only pseudofedrin, 
which actually does work. I went back today, you and I had a discussion about whether it works or not. There's at least two randomized controlled trials. I'm aware of one in adults, one in children. For, for cold symptoms. For just cold so symptoms, were... just that, yeah. right. Whether it reduces nasal congestion. And unlike phenylephrine, which seems not to work, pseudofedrin, the original pseudofed, does work even if it's harder to get behind the counter. And that's the one that's usually locked up. And then yes. what we're saying is they were selling the other ones and it was actually ineffective. That's and that's right. what the FDA group has said shouldn't work. That's so right. Through the Fed, it was right. Fedrin works, but the other one. And to be clear, neither of us has any financial stake in the <laughs> Sudafed brand. So No, I don't. No, I don't. And I still think we need more studies yeah. of all that stuff. Help Health and Veritas. Well, actually, you got to say you're the faculty director. Val, yeah. finish your part. Yeah, okay. So I'm uh, fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track and founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information uh, or check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA and keep the questions going. We will answer them if you send them in. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management and the Yale School of Public Health. Thanks to our researchers, Ines Gil and Sophia Stump, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon.